the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puff the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, too, but I've been quite busy. Busy doing what? Making up my Christmas card list and shopping for Christmas presents. Really, it's... My mother says the same thing. She does? Yes, just last night she said it again to my father. What did she say? She said, going into the stores these days is like going shopping with wildcats. It's worse. What could be worse? Going shopping in a store filled with women. Now, really, do you mean that? Well, it seems to me that when a man has to go to a store to buy presents for women, the women could let him get to the counter once every two days. Well, after Otherwise, all... Otherwise, how can he get back to the office to make money enough to buy presents for next year? Well, maybe... After all, if a man has got to... Could we please read the comics? And, and, and if he's... Uh, uh, well, what'd you say? The comics. Could we please read them? You mean... Uh... Could we please read now? The comics! funny papers. Oh, Puck the Comic Weekly. Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. It's early in the morning, and snores fill the darkness before dawn at the army post where Beetle is stationed. And Beetle and his pals are snug in their bed, dreaming of sugar plums, blueberry pie, and beautiful girls on the beach at Wake Eye. And then a flashlight breaks through the darkness takes out Beetle snoring away, and a corporal taps him on the back. Hey, Beetle, you're on KP this morning. <laughs> Beetle leaps up. Oh, what? What, 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 what? When and why? Hey, quiet, will ya? Hey, for Pete's sake! The corporal tells Beetle. Yeah, you got ten minutes to get over to the mess hall. Okay, I'll go quietly. Beetle slowly gets up. Oh! Last picture top row, he climbs back on the bed and heads for the washroom, stepping from one bed to the other. Ow, my back! Ow, my ear! Oh, my feet! Ow, my foot! Hey, why don't you walk on the floor? It's too cold on my bare feet. Hey, shut up, will you? Shut up, will you? Okay, okay, okay! So Beetle steps off the bed onto the cold floor. Ooh, it's still cold. And the men go back to sleep again. Just as everybody is back in Dreamland again, suddenly the lights come on. I turn off the light! One guy reaches for a sword. Turn off that light or else! I can't find my pants in the dark. few minutes later, third picture, bottom row, the lights are out, and everyone is sound asleep again. Suddenly, I know what! Out of the darkness comes Beetle's apologetic voice. I knocked over the butt can. Oh, what's the use? I'm gonna ask to be transferred overseas to battle duty. Yeah, me too. I'd rather fight a war than sleep in the same room with him. Ten minutes later, Beetle, wearing one shoe, no shirt, no pants, his coat and hat, comes to the mess hall for kitchen police duty. I'm sorry I'm late, but it's hard to dress in the dark. And last picture, two hours later, all the men in Beetle's bunkhouse are standing before the sergeant with a signed petition which reads... Please do not put that joint beetle on KP duty in the morning no more, on account of which we soldiers need plenty of sleep if this country is to be properly protected. 
sergeant roars, I don't care how many signatures you got on your petition. Bailey keeps pulling KP like everybody else. Oh, I don't know who to feel sorry for the most. Beetle hit the man. Well, I do. I like to sleep in the morning, and I think I feel more sorry for the men. But the men aren't smart. They should put Beetle's clothes all together under his pillows so he'll find them in the morning. That's an excellent idea. I hope the men heard that. Thank you. Well, now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look. Here's Dagwood and Blondie on page two. They haven't been there before. No, but sure enough, they're there now, and we won't waste a second. Here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. ram a food, ram a fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood's son, Alexander, who has never been on a date with a girl, tells his mother, Hey, Mama. This is the night I'm going to take Geraldine to the movie and to the Hamburger Palace. Last picture top row, Blondie makes the announcement to Dagwood. Alexander is going on his first date with a girl. Realizing his little boy is a big boy now, the tears trickle down Dagwood's cheeks. Seems to me only yesterday I was boiping him over my shoulder. <laughs> First picture, second row. Dagwood pulls Alexander to the bathroom. Come, son. You'll have to look awfully nice. A few minutes later, Dagwood is giving Alexander a bath. He's going to be clean. Hey, you're hurting me. Last picture, second row. Dagwood is brushing Alexander's teeth. Now, don't get excited and propose to her, son. She might accept. First picture, third row. Dagwood is helping Alexander around with his pants. Gee whiz, Pop, I can dress myself. Now, be a gentleman and remember to tip your hat. Five minutes later, Alexander is putting on his tie. His sister, Cookie, asks, If you marry Geraldine, will she be my aunt? That's not funny. Beat it. Last picture, third row. Alexander, all dressed up, looking like a moving picture hero, almost, announces, Well, I'm ready to go. All right, here's some money. And don't forget to tip your waiter. Oh, there's the bell. First picture, bottom row. Cookie answers the door. And there stands an awfully homely little boy. Cookie yells, Hey, Alexander, it's Geraldine's little brother. Geraldine's little brother walks into the living room. Geraldine's got the chicken box, and she says you should take me in her place. Oh, great Scott! And I took a bath for this. And last picture, Alexander marches off down the walk with Geraldine's little brother, who says... She looks real funny with all those spots. And Alexander's so mad, his face is one big red spot. Oh, poor Alexander. After all that trouble brushing his teeth and taking a bath, he has to go to the movies with Geraldine's little brother. Yes, what a disappointment on the first night when his mother and dad think he has grown up. Dagwood and Blondie shed their tears for nothing, didn't they? Yes, looks like we'll have to wait for another day for Alexander's first big date. Yes, I guess so. Well, now I'll bet you're anxious to know whether Robin Hood escapes from Prince John. Oh, yes, I am. Very well, let's go across the page, past Prince Valiant, who is going on a mission for his father today. Turn over that page, go across the page, and turn over page five. And there on page six is Robin Hood. Yes, and you remember last week that Robin had rescued the maid Marion from Prince John who had her locked up in a dungeon. That's right, and Robin had kept watch over the sheriff of Nottingham, so he could not give an alarm while three of his men escaped with the maid Marion. But then, when it came time for Robin to get away, the sheriff's men attacked Robin, and they began to close up the drawbridge. And Robin fought the men off, and although he was wounded, climbed up to the edge of the drawbridge to try to escape before it closed. Ooh. I wonder if he'll make it. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. So music, hi-ho! <laughs> Wounded and exhausted, Robin makes a final agonizing effort to lift himself over the closing drawbridge. He pulls himself over just as it crashes against the wall and topples into the moat below. The sound of the splash attracts the attention of the sentries on the wall above. There he is, in the boat. He's swimming to the other shore. Stop him, shoot him down. Angry arrows whiz from the battlement above. Zing viciously about Robin's bobbing head. 
last picture top row, Robin's men, who are waiting for him a short distance away, hear the tumult behind them. Hey, look, it's Robin in the boat. Quick, to the rescue. Robin's men rush back to the castle moat. And first picture, bottom row, one volley of the arrows sweeps the sheriff's bowmen from the castle walls. With his comrades covering the walls above, little John plunges recklessly into the boat. Just as Robin, weak from exhaustion, begins to sink beneath the water, little John seizes his arm. Master Robin! Master Robin! While his comrades stand guard, little John brings Robin to shore. And last picture, trembling with anxiety, Marion watches as the men gently lift the form of their unconscious leader onto the bank. Yes, and the way little John jumped into the water and saved Robin from drowning. But uh, I wonder, will they get away from there safely before the sheriff's men come out of the castle? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now let's see what Flash Gordon is doing. Oh, yes, because Flash is in terrible danger. Very well, let's go across the page, past Ben Bolt, turn over page 7, go past the Lone Ranger on page 8, turn over page 9, and there on page 11... It's Flash Gordon, who is on the planet Venus where he's been captured by the cruel King Stang. And Flash was sent by the king out into the forest to protect the queen. And they were attacked by a beetle that was as big as a dragon, and it had Flash in its claws. And the dragon could crush Flash like a peanut. How can Flash ever save himself? Well, let's read and see. So here we go with Flash Gordon. rigga digga doon doon saskimatash Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> the dragon clutches Flash in its claws, he fights back desperately. But Flash's chemi spray has no effect on the armored shell of the Venus swamp beetle. In a last desperate effort, Flash, last picture top row, aims an acid volley square into the giant scarab's mouth. The blast causes a strange chemical reaction within the beetle and the creature explodes with the violence of a mortar shell. For a moment, Flash is numb. But driven by fear of a new attack by beetles that may be lurking in the area, he shakes off the effects of the blast. And first picture, bottom row, orders... Come on, Vicky. Let's head for the jet car. The stranded craft is damaged too badly to permit a takeoff. But fortunately, the jet car's sonar phone still works. And Flash is able to beam an SOS to King Stang's castle. Flash Gordon calling... Flash Gordon calling King Stang. We need help. Hurry. Hurry. Night is closing in, and we may be attacked momentarily. Scarcely has Flash signed off, then Vicky cries out in terror. At last picture, the Earthman makes out the vague forms of a pair of weird flying reptiles with searchlight eyes probing the jungle for their prey. Yes, I don't think Flash has faced so many dangers in a short time as he has on this adventure on Venus. Oh, I, I hope he gets help from the palace quick. Well, next week we'll see if he does. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, my most favorite favorite, Uncle Remus and his tails of Bear Rabbit. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on page 12, under Little Iodine, is Uncle Remus and his Tales of Rare Rabbit. Magic words for the music, please. Say them with me, please. Hippity-hoppity, make make it a habit habit to give us music for old Brewer Rabbit. (laughs) Uncle Remus says, When Brewer Rabbit goes into business... He aims high. And today, Brer Rabbit has gone into a new business, hoping to make lots of money. He's standing in front of a sign which reads, Babysitter, 50 cents, any place, anywhere. And Mother Bird, seeing Brer Rabbit's sign, is sitting on Brer Rabbit's mailbox saying, Now you stay with my little aunt while I look for their papa. He's been missing all night. Yes, will you go on, Mrs. Bird? They'll be safe with me. Don't worry, I'll take care of them. And 
third picture, top row, Brer Rabbit is climbing up the tree to the bird nest. And one of the little birds exclaims, Hey, look at the babysitter. Yeah, a rabbit. Brer Rabbit greets them cheerfully. <laughs> uh, uh, hello, little bird. Brer Rabbit settles down at the edge of the limb close to the tree trunk and watches the little birds who are on their nest way out at the tip of the limb. Last picture, top row, one of the little birds cries, Hey, we are scared, Brer Rabbit. Yeah, come on out and help us. <laughs> Brer Rabbit nervously starts to crawl out on the branch. Carefully, he makes his way out on the branch, which begins to sway. The birds love this. Oh, goody, goody, goody. In first picture, bottom row, they begin to jump up and down on the nest, making it sway more. Yippee! rock a bye baby! Next we stop. Brer Rabbit nervously exclaims, Hey, 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 look out. You, 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 you'll fall. And then suddenly he slips. Hey, help! Oh, oh, oh. And he lands on the ground. And Brer Possum, who happens to be there, looks at him and says, Hey, Brer Rabbit, you look awful discongemerated. And Brer Rabbit groans, Guys, please. <laughs> Last picture, Burr Rabbit is back at his sign, which he has repainted. And now it reads, Farm hands, a day, 50 cents, any place, anywhere. And as Burr Rabbit looks at the words babysitter, which are now painted out, Uncle Remus says, Beware the business, but puts you out on a limb. (laughs) (laughs) This is one of the times when he had trouble. Yes, this is one of the times he was discombobulated. This was one of the times he was discombobulated. <laughs> yes. Well, now look across the page and see who's there. Roy Rogers. Yes, and he's inside the outlaw's hideout. That's right. He and his friend Brimstone Barlow are pretending to be outlaws. That's just a trick. To try to catch the outlaw gang and turn them over to the law. Yes. One of the outlaws, Gusty, took them to a shack and told him to wait inside until the leader of the outlaws, a man named the Sphinx, came to see them. And behind the door, there's a girl waiting with a gun in her hand. And I can't wait to see who she is and why she's there. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. hi yip by yo Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip by yo Roy and Brimstone step into the room. The door suddenly closes behind them. And Roy looks around to see a girl holding a gun on him. Hey, what's this? What did the Sphinx do with my father? I know he's here because he built the tunnels and tricked devices in this old mission. We're not in the Sphinx's gang, ma'am. We're posing as outlaws to round him up. Brimstone says, Yeah, and the maybe reform him. I didn't risk my life to sneak into this hideout to hear lies. Suddenly, Brimstone leaps forward, tries to take the gun away from the girl. <laughs> Guns is dangerous, ma'am. The gun accidentally goes off. Hey, somebody's coming. I hear a door. The sound of the shot brings one of the outlaws. As he rushes toward the shack, he sees one of the gang petting a dog. Hey, lay off that old man's mutt, will you? I told you to guard the strangers until the Sphinx sends for him. Another shot goes off. Hey, what the... He dashes to the shack. And gun in hand runs inside. First picture about him, Roy. Roy grabs him as he comes in. Hey, what's... The... Roy says to Brimstone, Hey, get outside. Don't let anybody in, Brimstone. She pulled the trigger, Roy. Almost got me. Grimstone takes the gun away from the girl, then quickly goes outside. The girl sees now that Roy is really trying to round up the outlaws. He helps Roy tie up the outlaw. I'm sorry I didn't trust you, but I'm so worried. When my father found he was working for outlaws, he planned to use his dog to destroy all the bandits. A dog? <laughs> At that moment, Brimstone, who's outside, sees the old outlaw who had been petting the dog. He sneaks up on him, saying to himself, Ah, there's one of them owl hoots. Maybe I can convert him to the side of law and order before it's too late. Last picture, Brimstone says, Hey, listen, mister. Crime don't pay. I know. And he puts his hand on the outlaw's shoulder. The man topples forward to the ground. Hey. He's dead. Oh, just a few minutes ago, that outlaw was petting the dog, and now the outlaw is dead. Yes, and the girl 
said her father was going to use the dog to destroy all the bandits. This is very mysterious. A man pets the dog, and then just a few minutes later, the man's dead. I wonder why. Well, maybe next week we'll find out. Now it's time to find out how Dick is getting along in that war between the Americans and the English. Oh, yes. I'm anxious to find out about that. All right. Let's go to the very last page of the Comic Weekly. The last page of the Comic Weekly. And here he is. And you remember last week the British Army had attacked the capital of our country, Washington, D.C. Yes, that was in the early days of America. And the Americans had been beaten away by the British attackers and chased out of the city. And then they set fire to the White House and all the other important buildings. Yes, the British did that to the American buildings. And Dick and a few friends tried to escape from the city by running across a bridge. And just when they were in the middle of the bridge, the British set fire to the bridge at the other end. And Dick and his friends who were on the bridge stopped to start to run back. And they looked back and they saw that the Virginian soldiers were setting fire to the bridge at the other end. So that the British couldn't come across, you see. Yes. Well, what will Dick do now? Standing on a burning bridge. Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Rickety pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Last picture, top row. Dick and his few friends stand on the burning bridge, caught between two fires. What to do? Dick doesn't hesitate a moment. First picture, second row, he leaps over and falls into the water below. The swift current of the river catches Dick and carries him downstream, down the Potomac, through waters that are reddened by the doomed city. Last picture, second row. Hours later, Dick finds himself swept against the shore. bruised and half alive and falls to the ground exhausted. <sighs> then out of the darkness, a figure appears. It's a man who kneels beside Dick. With expert fingers, he carefully examines Dick for wounds. <laughs> Dick opens his eyes. The man says, first picture bottom row, so I'm Dr. William Beans of Upper Marlboro, Maryland, my friend. The British are all around us. I'll get you to Baltimore. My carriage is on the road. Thank you. The doctor helps Dick to his feet, and they walk to the nearby road. But more than a carriage is waiting there on that road. For as Dick and the doctor approach the carriage, last picture, a British voice box. Halt! Who goes there? And Dick looks up to see three British soldiers confronting them with guns. Oh, no. Just as Dick was in friendly hands and could get help, this has to happen to him. Yes, and just when he thought he was going to escape. I wonder what will happen to him now that he's a prisoner of the British. Oh, we'll have to wait till next week to find that out. But now, look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, and everything is just wonderful for Mrs. Jones because Rusty gave her the money to save her farm from being taken away from her by that mean old Mr. Marlowe. Yes, and Rusty's friend Clem arrived in the nick of time with a $1,000 check, which the insurance company gave Rusty for helping save a ship from being destroyed. But Chuck said that he had bad news from Mr. Miles for Rusty. Oh, yes. Let's find out what that is. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Mrs. Jones and Clem and Rusty's friend Stovepipe talk. Rusty takes Tex aside and asks him, second picture, top row. Hey, Tex, what was the news from Milestone Farm? Uh, the news you said that I wouldn't like? Oh, oh, yes, that. Well, it's about that rascally Uncle Rufus of yours, Rusty. He's out of the clink and uh, hanging around waiting for you to get back. A cloud comes over Rusty's face, last picture, top row. Uncle Rufus? Well, jeepers, Tex, that is bad news. No, 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 don't you fret about that ornery maverick. Mr. Miles won't let him make trouble for you. Oh, and by the way, Pete's dad will be back from Europe by the time we reach Milestone. First 
first picture, bottom row, Rusty and his dog, Flip, are out in the pasture. Rusty is mighty unhappy. And he says to Flip, Golly, Flip, looks like you and I are going to have to light out for the wide open spaces. I'd rather be at Milestone Farm and any place in the world. But, but my Uncle Rufus said if I didn't help him to get money from Mr. Miles, he'd take me away. So I, I guess it's best for you and me to, to go away. A half hour later, back at the farm, Stovepipe is saying to Tex, Well, gentlemen, it appears that my direct connection with this happy incident is ended. I will bid you a regretful farewell and rejoin Denver Dooley's carnival. Tex replies, Oh, yes, and uh, Rusty better go out there with you, Doc, and bring back that horse. Uh, Pete and I'll get the others ready for shipment to River City tomorrow. Still later that afternoon, last picture, a man approaches the barn in the Jones farmyard, leading a horse. He says to Tex, Hey, you the fellow they call Tex? Kid's name Rusty. Give me a buck to bring this nag here and hand you this letter. What? A letter? Hey, give it here. Oh, Rusty isn't leading the horse, and it's a letter for Tex. You know what? I'll just bet you the letter tells Tex that Rusty's running away. Oh, I hope not. But Rusty is afraid of his uncle, so maybe you're right. I can't wait until next week to find out. Well, we'll just have to do everything we can to make next week get here quickly, and I promise to do that. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right. Mr. Tommy Quickly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you, happy boy, honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.